Just press the issue. Yeah, we're now recording. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Culture Central. Thank you, Culture Response Unit. I'm Alison Gray, and together with my panel, Tyrone, Paige, and Sarah, we're going to explore and discuss some key themes about freelancing and what makes a successful freelancer today. So welcome to you all. Um, we're going to use the chat function as well. That's going to be monitored throughout. So we're going to have the set that we're going to break today's session into four key themes. And at the end of each theme, we're going to take a couple of questions from um, all of you and then we'll move on. But we have also allowed time at the end of the session to answer any further questions. So if you've got a question about what's being discussed, please pop it in the chat. If we don't get to it, straight off we'll come back to it later on and i'm also really delighted to have rinku balpaga here today um who is part of the west midlands freelance task force and he's going to talk to us a little bit about that at the end so welcome everybody thank you for taking time out today um why am i here who am i i'm alison grade i'm the author of the freelance bible and as well as being a career freelancer and serial entrepreneur i work as a trainer and a mentor as well as a strategic consultant specializing in creative industries and i describe my key skill as transforming creative ideas into a business reality and it's a common theme across all the work i do i do it through the book i books i write the freelancers and smes i mentor and the companies i advise and since lockdown began i've heard from hundreds of freelancers many of whom are wrestling with what, what can I do now? The industry's in hibernation. And this session today we've put together, which we hope will inspire and empower you to find out what you can do and how you can find opportunities. So before we get right into the detail, I'd love to hear some introductions from my panel, Tyrone, Paige, and Sarah. So Tyrone, if you'd be kind enough to kick us off, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, my name's Tyrone Huggins. I'm an actor, a playwright, uh, director, and I've been working in theatre since about 1979. So I've kind of, I've done about, I've performed in about 90 productions. I've written 17 plays, um, not all of them produced, unfortunately. Um, but I've been sort of, I was brought up here in Birmingham, born in the Caribbean. Um, went to university in Leeds and uh, travelled around a bit before returning back to live in Birmingham in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, my education was in maths, physics and chemistry. My degree is in metallurgy. I decided I wanted to be a performer when I was about nine years old. And I've been kind of uh, working towards just doing that ever since. Uh, I kind of I, I registered as self-employed in and around about 1980 83 i think somewhere like that so i've been a freelancer since then and sort of i kind of characterize my activities as uh, ducking and diving that's me thanks tyrone page love to hear from you hi uh, can everyone hear Brilliant. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Paige, uh, pronoun she, her. Um, I am a Brummie, born and bred, um, and kind of my role, not kind of my role, my role is a producer, so I'm a freelance producer working in the arts and cultural sectors primarily, um, and I kind of jump into other sectors every now and then. Um, sometimes they merge all together. Um, I've been freelancing now full time for the past four years, um, part time I would say for the past six, seven years. Um, and a lot of my work um, revolves around, as I said, arts cultural sector. Um, I work with uh, multi-arts, um, multi um, collectives and groups, so theatre groups, musical groups. Um, I also work with kind of um, a variety of communities um, on a project by project basis. Um, and then I tend to work, also work on kind of large citywide festivals. Um, so Funny Things Festival in Wolverhampton 2019, um, Festival of Audacity with Beat Freaks uh, 20. 18 and I'm currently doing some work with um, Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games at the moment um, so yeah I, I guess kind of for me 
um, my aspirations, my ethos, what drives me um, are kind of mental health, um, childhood, early years, families, communities, um, and yeah, just everything else in between, really. Uh, so that's kind of one shot tour for me. Brilliant. Thanks, Paige. And Sarah, last but not least. Hi, everyone. So I'm Sarah. I trained as an actor a lifetime ago in Birmingham. Um, I'm currently a training manager in film and TV. So I uh, design production courses for film and TV professionals. I'm currently working at the Production Guild. Um, in terms of a freelancer, I'm also a psychotherapist and I have my own mental health company that specialises in, well, supporting people within the creative industries, predominantly in film and media. Um, so that's my real passion is about trying to change the industry one step at a time. So that's me. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. So um, just to, to, to get started on this session, I think when we think about freelancing, I think we often think about what we do as freelancers rather than why companies hire us. And, and I, think I always like to start by reflecting back on why, why do companies hire us? I think there's really two reasons why a company will hire a freelancer, either because they need specialist services. So that, and the, those sort of specialist services are the sort of services that they don't want to have in-house full time. They don't need them. They often can't afford them because they're highly specialist, therefore expensive. Or they'll hire freelancers because they need extra capacity. It's a busy time. I need more people in the team to deliver what I, what I do. So if you can understand which of these aspects you offer to your clients, and it might be that you do both. I certainly do both for different clients in different ways. There'll be times when I come in and I add capacity because somebody's really busy and I know what to do and I can just help them out for a little bit. But a lot more of my time is spent delivering specialist services. So if you can understand and which type of offer you have you can start to understand why companies will bring you in and when and it doesn't really matter in that case whether you're what I call a traditional eye-shaped freelancer which is somebody who's got a huge amount of experience in one specific area or if you're more of a t-shaped freelancer which is someone with a, a certain amount of experience but a breadth of experience as well a sort of breadth of collaboration and and those people very much like we have from Paige just now who's an enabler a facilitator a producer a translator and that's quite a new area for freelancing we often think about that very old traditional eye-shaped freelancer as the only type of freelancer but t-shaped freelancers are a lot more common and once you get your head around the fact that that's valuable as an offering as a freelancer it can open up so many more opportunities so for me successful freelancers are people who work on their freelancing and as, as well as in their freelancing and what I mean by this that it's not enough just to do the work you do spinning all those different client plates you've got to work on your freelancing and that means wearing lots of different hats it means being the ceo of your freelancing operations being the fd the finance director making sure you send the invoices out making sure the money's coming in and also wearing that sales and marketing hat and getting your pipeline filled so you've got more clients coming through so that but what makes a successful freelancer and and i imagine it like a three-legged stool you know the old-fashioned sort where you can where you know three legs quite rickety but you can only sit comfortably on top of the stool if all the legs bear equal weights and as a freelancer you are that person sitting on the stool and the legs represent the skills that you have your financial drive and your passions and if you take away one leg the stool falls over so think about it if you take away financial drive you just have skills and passion left and really that's a hobby that's not a freelance career so very much with freelancing all the legs need to bear that equal weight and not only that you as the freelancer need to be sitting on top of this stool looking up with a smile on your face so looking after your mental health is also important so today in this in this webinar we're going to look at each of these three each of these four themes your skills your mental health your financial drive and your desires so let's move on to the skills part of it because um, that's really where it all starts from. What skills do I have? What have I got on offer? So if as a freelancer, I can understand what skills I've got 
on offer, I can start to think about um, how I can package those. So I'm going to say we're going to send around through um, the cultural response unit a handout about how to do a skills audit after the session. So don't worry on this just to don't worry that you need to take down every single detail on this bit. So the skills audit is a great way to understand what skills you have and it asks you to think about three different types of skills your hard skills which are those technical skills you use to do the work that you do so if i'm um if i'm working in theater production and i'm the lighting designer those are all my technical lighting design type skills or if i'm a stage manager it's my stage management skills whatever that might be in the work that you do those are your hard skills the technical skills that you use to do the work that you do and then the next skill is your soft skills. And these are all your social, your personal and interpersonal skills that are easily transferable across industries. So how good you are at leadership, managing a team, your communication skills, your organizational skills, all of those skills, they're often referred to as relative skills because you can relate them to lots and lots of different sectors and fields. So we've got hard skills, we've got soft skills, and the final type of skill is your other skills. And those are any skills, knowledge, expertise that you have that don't fit into any of those other categories. It could be the hobbies, your passions, things that you know an awful lot about, but you've never really seen them in a work context. You've never really thought about how do those skills fit into my work but they are skills and they are tools that you have that you can use so it's worth writing those down so the skills audit asks you to write a list of all the skills you currently have in each of those three categories so you're looking at writing a big list of bullet points of all those different skills so you start by writing down where am i at now i'm writing down that list of skills the next thing it asks you to do is to think about well where do i want to get to where do i want to be at some future point so at the moment as we're transitioning out of um lockdown and things are starting to ease in some sectors but not in others you might think about well actually where do i want to be in six months time rather than five or six years time because that might be the really important piece of the jigsaw that you're trying to put together but think about where you want to get to at a future point in time and then think about well what are all the skills that I might need to do that sort of work so what might I need to have and again write that bullet list of all of those skills so once you've got that you've got a really detailed list of all the sorts of skills that you need and now you need to rate your ability so on a five point scale so if zero is I've got no ability and four is I'm excellent at this so you write your ability across where you are now with all of those skills where you want to get to with all of those skills so you've got a sense of where you think you're at and that's brilliant that's a really good starting point but the next bit for me is where it gets really interesting because corroboration is a really important part and that's done by asking friends colleagues um family whoever you trust who give you who know people who know you well who understand you who'll give you an honest report back and ask them to look at the list you've written and ask them to rate you on the skills that you've got where where do they think you're at and um, have you listed all the relevant skills perhaps maybe there's other skills that they would add in maybe there's things that they 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 think actually you know you're really good at this because what i find is that the things that we take for granted in ourselves are often the things that others value in us so and we can't see what those are very easily because we so take them for granted in ourselves um so that corroboration piece can be really eye-opening to understand where your clients value you where your special skills are that secret source that you do that you don't even realize you do because it comes so naturally to you so you've got your list of bullet points where you are where you want to get to you've got your ratings you've got your corroborated corroborated ratings from your trusted colleagues so from that you can pull out an action plan of 
what skills you need to improve to take it forward, to take yourself forwards and to drive your, to drive your freelance career forward. Because it's always tempting to improve the bits that we're good at, because we often like those the most, and it's the kind of comfortable code. But that's not going to improve your entire offering. What's going to improve your offering is improving the bits you're not so good at. So that's a whistle stop through, tour through the skills audit. As I said, we will send the, the detail behind that over to you after this webinar so you can work on that in your own time. But now I'd really like to hand over to the panel and ask you to just talk to me about what skills your clients most value from you. So, um, I don't know, Tyrone, do you wanna kick us off here? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I th you know, taking that idea of uh, the, the skills and in this order that you gave them, I'd say that my technical skills actually break down into three different fragments. And the first one of those is as an actor. As an actor, my technical skills are being able to use my voice um, to work physically on stage. I'm quite a physical performer. Um, being able to sort of interpret text and um, sort of bring solutions into the room. But that sort of started sort of at school. I did lots of plays at school. It just happened to be one where we did three plays a year. So between 11 and 19, I kind of was doing plays all the time. And then when I left university, a group of us founded our own company and uh, we started devising our own work. And that sort of, I was able to bring, if you like, my actor skill to what I call the performer skills. And I separate actors and performers only for a, a, a kind of particular reason that actors have to have a, a, a great deal more technical skills in terms of, you know, um, and interpreting text, in terms of voice, in terms of the, the um, techniques of performance. But whereas a performer can actually bring their whole selves to a, a piece because an actor, you know, the, the, the description that I was once given, an actor's job was to remember your lines and not bump into the furniture, i.e. that's what you're being asked to do. Kind of, it's a very, you're there to serve the text and the director, whereas a performer in a devising situation, you're bringing all the other elements of yourself into the room and hoping that they'll be taken up. So that's the first area of my technical skills is in acting. But actually when we did start this company, I had other technical skills. I would learned to weld uh, with my dad in, at Longbridge here in Birmingham. And so when we for, formed our company, um, no one else could do any set building, carpentry stuff. So I became the set builder and sort of I brought the technical, uh, you know, uh, skills of sound engineering. I built a, 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 an amplifier when I was at school. And so I kind of had an, an idea about those. So I brought those kind of technical, really technical skills into, into the room when we uh, founded the company. The, the last sort of technical skill I'd say is I developed organizational, an understanding of the organizations, uh, a very, Soon after I uh, we started Impact in, in Leeds, I was approached by someone who is some young boys had just come out of school. They had wanted to start their own dance company, and I was asked to go on the road with them and show them how to um, do lights and sound. And but actually later I was invited to join the board, and as a result, I started to I, I, I asked my question self question why why would I join the board of an arts organization well the reason I justified for myself was to understand what the relationship is between the superstructure if you like the organizational state of a company and that moment when I step out on stage and meet an audience and so I developed uh, over the years I, I, I kind of I, I became chair of that company later I then joined the board of the uh, Birmingham rep in order to understand uh, how, a, if you like, a bigger organisation's board work, and, and currently I'm, I'm I'm chair of Friction Arts here in Digbeth. But all of that understanding of how the structure of the, or the 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 industry I'm in is a kind of other technical skills. I I understand the sort of the language and the way it works. Um, 
So that's my, uh, in terms of all those, uh, you know, technical skills. I'd say what, what my soft skills are, are more about sort of being a calm person and being sort of always the one who's calm in the room, but also because I have an education from outside the arts that the scientific principle gives me a way of approaching ideas that are slightly left field and, and, and different quite often to other people I, I work with. So that's one of the sort of soft skills I bring to the, to the room, I think. And then the other skills are, I don't know, it's sort of, um, yeah, I'd say that's in, in that personality, that area of personality that I, have, uh, I tend to prefer to work one-to-one -one with people. So when I'm on the stage working with another actor, I prefer to work with them, them and let the, doc the director work with us as a, as a unit rather than working through the director towards my uh, fellow actor. A bit of a big answer, but sort of, a, you know, t picking up those technical soft and other skills, I think mm, that's how I'd place them using your, your analysis, uh, Alison. Brilliant. Thanks, Taron. It's interesting to see you pulling from so many different aspects of your career and making different things work together. Sarah, I just wonder whether, what, what, what do you think your clients most value from you in terms of what you deliver for them? Yeah, it's quite interesting because I was thinking, I mean, I think my sort of soft skills, my, you know, I like people is probably my strongest suit. You know, I haven't got, you know, technical skills. I was thinking, you know, as an actor, the ability to orate, you know, is such a useful thing. And also in my training then as a psychotherapist, I think that's really played into my I've soft skills. So I'm good at least. Oh, can, have you got that? You're just coming and going a little bit on the audio. Paige, I'll pop over to you. Do you want to just so, check yeah. your audio? Sorry. Oh, it's not. Yeah. It's all good for me. Do you want to go to Paige? Can you hear me now? Yes. Can someone tell me if it's me or is Sarah breaking up for everyone? She's dropping out for me as well. Just a little, yeah. She's dropping out for me as well. Just a little. Okay, bizarre. Paige. Yeah, um, I think kind of picking on what Sarah was trying to say and also what Tyrone has mentioned as well. I think although you might work in different sectors, you might be at different stages of your kind of like freelance career. Essentially, I think the biggest skill um, that we as freelancers can offer our clients um, is that intersection of skills that we have, the breadth of skills that we've built up. Um, whether that be um, kind of, you know, more your, your personal soft skills or like the technical skills. Um, and I think for me, my ability to um, think critically, um, I love to problem solve. Um, I'm not one to shy away from a challenge. Um, yeah, I think it's just really important to be confident in that space and to show um your client that you're you know you have that ability to critically think and maybe bring some I other ideas into the mix um yeah so i think that idea of like kind of breadth of breadth of skill and the intersection of skills that you build up throughout your lifetime and never really um underestimating what you know you you might think for example a certain soft skill is not useful or can't be utilized in the situation but actually you'll be surprised because you're doing it all the time um so yeah i think i'll, I'll keep it short and sweet on that one it's it for me it's the intersection of skill and especially when a client says oh i didn't think about that or oh you think about that in a different way that's really helpful that's really useful um those are kind of like the key moments they're like my favorite kind of moments and of course organization like be super organized um it's helpful for you and your clients oh brilliant thank you Paige um and that really links to um where we're going next because not only is understanding what skills you've got like on the practical level those hard skills soft skills and other skills but I think particularly um one of the questions that I'm talking to a lot of freelancers about is who are you when you remove the mask or the label um, of the job title, the work that you do, the credit, whatever you want to call it? Because um, if you look under the bonnet and you identify the skills that you have, you know, but that 
you know, in particularly film and TV, where I, which is where I did a lot of my work, your, your job title, that's what goes on your CV. That tells everybody everything they need to know. But actually, in this, in the current climate where there's sectors in hibernation and particularly across the creative, creative industries, you know, as Paige said, we're great creative problem solvers. So how do we look at what we do and the journey of our work and what we actually deliver? but without the label there. So let me give you an example, a producer that I mentored recently who produces a lot of fil film theater productions and spends a lot of her time bringing very, dis very separate um, artistic teams together. So it'll be a stage team who's making the stage production and the film crew, and they've got to work together to allow the stage team to deliver the best performance they can to the paying audience and for the cameras. But then the camera team have got to work to, um, re to get the shots that they need and the lighting and everything else. So it's two worlds coming together and they, it's not an easy jigsaw puzzle to fit together. And so when we talked about what she was doing and what the opportunity for, was for her, because those, those projects aren't happening at the moment, we realized that her core skill actually underneath it all was bringing together two very different tribal groups and getting them to perform together in a new way. So this completely opened up her eyes to a whole new opportunity because she went, well, actually, there must be opportunities in the corporate world, in a non-creative space, to help companies who are trying to bring different teams together and help them perform with competing agendas. So she's now looking at how she can use her people management and team building skills with very different tribes to help companies and deliver that. So I think one of the questions that I'm interested in, particularly to the panel and to, to, to you audience, is who are you when you remove that mask or that label? I'm tempted to go straight back to you, Paige, because you kind of started touching on this already. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one because sometimes it can feel really blurred, the lines between um, you in a professional capacity and then kind of you just kind of personally um but then they are very they can be very separate um i think for me who am i behind the mask um i think honesty is a is a big one um uh, you know people have always said sometimes oh you're too honest um that's your opinion um but for me it works well you know especially when i'm first meeting a client you know from working with a group of artists and you know, it's it's all it's always about putting it all on the table. So I think I've given the example before. Um, a, a, a collective, an artistic collective group might come to me and say, "Oh, we're looking for a producer. Um, you've come on our radar. Can we have a conversation?" And I'll say, "Yeah, of course. Let's have a chat. Let's uh, talk through it. What are you looking for?" And I might come to the realization, you know, actually. I really love your work. I really want to go and see your work. Um, I'm going to buy a ticket and invest in your work. But in terms of the process, maybe my values and ethos don't align. Maybe we don't have the same, something's not quite connecting. So on this occasion, I don't think I'm the right producer to work with you. But listen, one of my, somebody else that I know in my circles who's a producer, I think actually you'd connect really well. Um, so I, I definitely do value that as kind of like a, a, a personal skill or trait that I have that works very well in, in the kind of professional realm that I work as a producer because people know what they're going to get. They know who I am and they can always trust that I'm going to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I think honesty is just one that I'll bring to the table and compassion as well. I know it's something we all like to think we're all yeah. compassionate um, and I'm not saying that some people aren't. Maybe we have differing levels of compassion. But for me specifically, you know, I speak very openly and honestly about my mental health, um, kind of back, my backgrounds and issues with mental health over the past 12 years. And that's, you know, complex diagnosis, you know, depression, anxiety, bipolar, PTSD, you know, all of it mixed together. I've had to go through a lot of personal growth, a lot of, um, grieving a lot of healing and in that process it's really allowed me to when I meet individuals I really try and find the best in them I try and understand why they're behaving the way that they are 
why they sometimes interact in certain situationships, why they build relationships in certain ways. Um, and I think without my own kind of introspection and my own process of understanding myself, I would not necessarily be able to have the same amount of compassion for, for others. Um, so again, I feel like for me, that's a really strong skill that I have um, when I'm working with people and it can really help to avoid a lot of conflict um, because you're not just looking at someone and thinking, oh, they're really rubbish at something or why have they done that? You know, you can step back and think, well, maybe they've done that because of this, this, this. Let's have a chat. Let's just be open and honest. Let's have a talk through it. Let's get through the situation. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on that f f for me. Um, but those, I think, would I'd say that's kind of who I am behind the mask, really. Thank you, Paige. And, and Sarah, I know we've had conversations about this in the last few months as well. What, what, where, where do you, where are you, who are you when you remove the mask and the label? Are you there? Sorry, did you say me? I did say you. I've got, you... I've got some slightly unstable connection. I'm not sure quite what's going on in the area. So I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I think behind the mask, you know, I think my counselling skills definitely come into play. So obviously there's a compassion and sort of a genuine empathic response to people um, when I work. And I think that really works in terms of my soft skills when I'm going in to develop something or I'm going to create a course with a producer or, um, you know, and we're working collaboratively. And I think I'm, I would like to think I'm quite good at reading people. And it's those kind of skills that really come into play when you want to, you know, come up and work in partnership with somebody. And it's kind of utilising them, but also being aware because sometimes I'm aware of myself that I'm not always so good at negotiating because I'm always too busy trying to understand somebody and where they're coming from. And that can be, you know, and then I've sort of dropped the mask too much and that can be a flaw, really. So, yeah, I think it's being mindful of what works. And I think one of the interesting conversations you and I have had, Sarah, during lockdown is around the idea that whilst you do do the counselling, actually what your core skill is, is helping. And I've taken a lot. What, what I hear is, is a lot around and you're going to talk about it in a minute anyway, but it is around, you know, helping people improve their mental pathways and how they think about things and we've been talking about taking that outside of the counseling situation and going well actually if i've got um ambitious career professionals if i could help them improve their thinking their neural thinking pathways then they can perform better in a leadership and management situation and, and that for me is a lot around how what happens when you take off the mask is actually understanding the processes and the way that you do what you do and how you can pivot that and translate it into a new place so that's part of part of the thinking that you can ask yourself and particularly when we're looking at situations where there isn't the traditional work available to us as freelancers. How can we utilize that DNA that we have, the way that we look at the world in new environments? So, so that's, that's, that's really interesting to me. Tyrone, just a quick thought before um, we just take a couple of questions. So if anyone's got any questions, pop them in the chat. Yeah, I'd say, if, when, who am I when I take off the mask? I think I'd probably say I'm a hermit. That I, you know, that I kind of almost professionally, I'm a very, very sociable person. But when I'm kind of myself, I kind of like my own company. And I sort of like to spend time in a way in my own interior world. And, and then the people that I do engage with, I kind of, as I said earlier, I kind of prefer to engage with people on a one on one basis so that I kind of get the full richness of the experience otherwise i kind of happily sketching through uh, ideas thoughts feelings in in my notebook so i'm a bit of a hermit when i'm not a professional if you like <laughs> brilliant is there any any questions from anyone on anything we've talked about in terms of skills and taking the mask off anything in the chat i can't is there anything there no you're all very quiet. You're all very quiet. Um, cool. Well, then thinking shall we... deep thoughts. Thinking deep thoughts. Yes, they've all gone turn into hermits. 
no, no, I'm sure not. Um, so shall we then um, move on, Sarah? And, and really, I think it would be great now to look into um, those, the mental health pathways and the thinking and how, how we can understand as a freelancer the tricks that our brain plays on us and spotting some signs of mental health challenges. So I'm definitely not the expert on this. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah and I know she's prepared a few slides just to illustrate some things and then we're going to um, uh, open it up to the panel and then to discussion. So Sarah, without further ado. Hi everyone. Yeah, so I'm going to hopefully share some slides and I hope that my connection doesn't keep dropping in and out. Um, so let me just share my screen with you and I'm hoping that's working for everybody. So I thought what we'd look at is it's quite interesting to work out kind of just where mental health comes from, just to put it into perspective. So um, you know, if we look at George Engel, who was an American psychiatrist, he, he said mental health, it was like a biopsychosocial model, we call this. And you kind of, it's like an interlocking of those three elements within those three factors that contribute to poor mental health and people's susceptibility, susceptibility to having mental health issues. So if we look at biological aspects of the biopsychosocial model, um, we can look at some factors here, like for example, illness, um, genetic issues, um, gender. This is often when we look at suicide prevention because we know that far more males um, are likely to die by suicide than females. So we look at, they're the bio, biological factors. And then we can move on to psychological factors. So does somebody have depression, anxiety, low resilience, uh, low self-esteem? So that's your psychological factors. Um, social factors so this is kind of from a sociological perspective you know what's the environment around us do we have good peer support we can kind of think about also past history where was somebody brought up um, in care um, childhood sexual abuse we know the consequences of that can be grave and it's by putting these three together and, and the idea of the model was it wasn't just you know you had one thing from a biological factor and that would lead to, to poor mental health it's the interplay of the three so something from each and it's how they over overlap between each other you know and we know a lot about how the mind the body connection you know there's a great book by Bessel van der Kolk called the mind the body keeps the score um, all about how our psychological perspective can influence biological factors so it is the interplay of these and then I've added on the end current life events because from a mental health perspective, current life events can add to, to somebody's uh, disposition to have a mental health illness. You know, for example, trauma, loss, redundancy, bereavement, um, all of these things. So when we put the model together, you'll see how these three overlap. So this is George Engel's biopsychosocial model. So factors, the interplay of factors from these three things that contribute to somebody struggling with their mental health. Um, and then we have current life events. And you'll notice that I've displayed current life events like this because the thing with current life events, if you think now very much about this pandemic, they can either add as a contributing factor to somebody struggling with their mental health or preventative. So, you know, if you think at the pandemic at the moment, obviously that's had a massive impact on people's mental health. And, you know, there was a study done by LSE and it was, you know, people's well-being was far worse now in April 2020 than it was the previous year. And that's no surprise. Um, but current life events can also act as a buffer. You know, if you think you've got a good peer support, you know, you're part of a really good creative community, you have a supportive family, you know, that, that can act as almost like a protective factor. So even if you have elements from the other three that, that could make you, you know, predisposed to struggling with your mental health, you could have positive factors from current life events. Um, and I was trying to think about, you know, I've counseled a lot of people during this time, during this pandemic, and I was thinking about kind of the themes that have come up, trying to find if there was one theme that's sort of a thread almost, if you like, that went through. And I guess it was the theme of loss, because, and these were just some of the ideas I was thinking about what people have talked about, they've lost. And it's, you know, even if it's not a direct bereavement, it's that loss of kind of, you know, it can be coping strategies. If you've struggled with poor mental health before and you've had certain coping strategies that have acted as your kind of buffer and, and you might have lost them in this lockdown. Um, 
you know, at the moment it is our primitive mind knows something bad is happening, but we can't really see it. And so it's sort of broken our sense of safety, both collectively and personally. Um, and so there is this sense of grieving on both a macro and a micro level. Um, you know, social contact, obviously in lockdown, people lost social contact. And very much future path was one that came up a lot. I think we get very used to, especially as freelancers, always thinking about what's our next gig? What, what are we going to do next? What work are we going to generate next? And all of a sudden, you know, the future path was hazy. There was this great big, you know, coronavirus obstruction in the middle. And it was almost having to try and find an acceptance of that, that all we could do was kind of sit on the bench at the side of that metaphorical path and wait for it to abate because actually none of us could go anywhere. And I think initially, you know, it really was a trauma response, you know, where then the typical trauma response is there's this adaptive phase at the start that then bottoms out into the dis this disillusionment phase, which is where I feel people are really now. And the idea is you come out the other side in the heroic phase where you've learned lots about yourself. Um, and kind of in this disillusionment phase, it was very much about finding acceptance of where we were. Um, so on that basis, you know, if we talk about the coronavirus, you know, everybody's had a totally unique experience and has been impacted in many different ways. And in part, this will be to what, what influences people's mental health, you know, what protects it and what can be it can add to making people suffer with mental health illness. Um, so some of them which have come up a lot in my counselling, and I think as freelancers, these are the ones when Alison talks about being aware, you know, when, of what's sort of hindering you on your, you know, career progression, I guess, if you like, what's putting those barriers in the way. Um, you know, cognitive distortions are, are really common. And it is, you know, don't believe everything you think. Thoughts are definitely not facts. And if you think of the cognitive behavioral model, it's thoughts, you know, trigger an emotion, it triggers a feeling, which triggers a behavior, which makes you feel a certain way and goes back to another thought. So it's really important that quote there, you know, don't believe everything you think is really essential. And there's lots of these and they can be really interesting to look at because actually, you know, I identify so many in myself and without looking at them, you don't, you're often not aware that you've lapsed into thinking in this really habitually unhelpful way. So for example, if we look there, you know, you can see mental filters just disqualifying out the positives, you know, you, you just focus on the negative, um, which is a freelancer is not helpful. Should statements, and I, I put this in because at the moment, especially at the start of lockdown, should statements were really prevalent because everybody was, you know, I should be writing a book, I should be, you know, doing my filing cabinet out, I should be painting the house, because there was this sudden luxury of time, if you like, and so there was this everybody started to think that they should be doing something. And the problem with shoulds and oughts and musts is if you start the day with, I should be doing out my filing cabinet or I should be reorganizing my you know, freelance accounts, yeah. invariably you're gonna to go to bed at the end of the day going, I should have organized out my filing cabinet and I should have done my accounts. You're just not gonna do it. If, if, if should is in there, invariably you're not gonna do it. And the end consequence of that is you'll go to bed feeling guilty. Um, uh, personalization is is another one and there, there's a really good um, psychologist called Martin Seligman from America and it's the three P's of emotional resilience and the factors that are really negative in terms of emotional resilience and is personalization pervasiveness and permanence and you know so it's person like the mental filter disqualifying the positive I like to describe it. it's like a drop of ink in a glass of water so that one negative you let it permeate and it, it spreads across the whole job you're doing, you know, one error tarnishes the whole. And so that personalization is the blaming of yourself. And then the permanence is, you know, it's, it's ink that's going to last forever. You can never erase it. Um, and the pervasiveness is, you know, it's tarnished everything and you can't get that back. Um, so these are just important to look at catastrophizing. Obviously, everyone knows. And hindsight bias is something Alison and I talked about a lot around this pandemic is that there's an awful lot, whether it's politicians and people commenting. And it's almost with hindsight bias, thinking if only I'd known then what I know now, I could have put something into pl to place. You know, if I'd known as a freelancer, I was going to have really a quite really no work possibly, well, especially in the industry I work, film and TV. You know, if I'd known when my job finished in December, um, and I decided to take three months off, you know, or I should have known somehow that I wasn't going to then get a job in March because we were going to be in the midst of a lockdown. And that's just hindsight bias. You know, you can't know that stuff before it happens. 
So it's important to remember that and one small positive thought in the morning can change your whole day. As naff as that might sound, it really can. So I just thought they'd be quite helpful to look at. And another thing that can influence our vulnerability, um, you know, it, to our influence our susceptibility, if you like, to mental health disorders will be, you know, our vulnerability to stress. And we all have different vulnerability based on almost the biopsychosocial model, you know, what was in those three cores for us? What do we have? Do we have a genetic issue? Do we have illness? Do we have low immunity? Um, from the social side, do we not have a good support network? And all that sort of makes us more susceptible depending on what we've got in those circles to stress and this was Zubin and Spring did the stress and vulnerability model and there's a lot around but it, you know you can liken it to a brick wall it's kind of how are your foundations built you know are you do you have not many factors in that that biopsychosocial model have you had a really supportive family have you grown up you know has your path been fairly unhindered to this point you know are all your bricks you know is all the pointing perfectly in line um and everybody has so everybody will have a different different vulnerability to stressful situations based on almost the stress and vulnerability model and how their brick wall is built are their foundations strong and sturdy so every time you place another layer of stress on top they they can tolerate it because they have that really solid core or you know have you struggled have you got you know different areas that you need to look at and maybe you had a difficult upbringing and maybe you haven't quite got that solid foundation through no fault of your own you know these are all environmental factors and it just means another layer of brick on top could be too much and then at that point cracks start to show and that can be the start of a mental health breakdown so i think it's really important to be aware that everybody ha has different vulnerabilities and everybody will have a different shaped wall and it's important to be aware of that with other people, you know, things that might not feel particularly stressful to you, to somebody else could be their tipping point. It could be the cracks in the foundation start to show. Um, and th this is called a stress bucket. Mental health first aiders use this and it's quite just quite a good visual tool in order to look at our own mental health and where we are as freelancers and especially so that we can recognize where other people are as well. So, you know, if you look at the stress bucket there, so the size of the container kind of represents the size of your vulnerability to stress. So if you have a tiny little bucket, you are really vulnerable to stress and pressure. And the more that fills in the top, the more likely it is, unless you're opening that tap at the side and unloading some of that stress, that, that you're gonna reach a tipping point. And you know, I was giving a talk for some film and TV freelancers uh, last week, and uh, you know, a lot of those that I've counseled, their stress bucket's already very full, full you know, even if they have quite, large bucket and they're not that vulnerable they're quite full and people start going back to work and they start with all that pressure on top and unless you put self-care techniques in place so this is that tap um, whether that be mindfulness or um, you know seeking outside support just talking to people you know can make all the difference about how you feel and um, exercise you know we all know the things that you know help us feel better um, and and that's what empties our stress bucket and I think it's really aware, important to be aware of how full yours is at any one time. And do you need to do a few more self-care techniques to empty it in order to be the best you can be and to, and to not reach the tipping point. You know, we don't want to reach where we're at capacity and we're starting to struggle with anxiety and depression and we really need to get help. Um, so I hope that's helpful as a visual representation. Um, and th this was control the controllable it is, you know, in this lockdown, especially and in this whole situation, there isn't much we can control. There's an awful lot outside of our control. And it can be really useful to almost draw your circles of control. And this is based on Stephen R. Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it can be really useful to draw a tiny circle. And inside, that's your circle. That's what you can control. And you write everything you can control. So your thoughts, your actions, um, what self-care techniques you employ. And then you draw an outer circle. And in that, you write everything out of your control, which at the moment, you know invariably is a lot you know you can't control you know will we go back into lockdown will we not you can't control if there will be a second wave you maybe can't control when your next you know employment opportunity will come you can make steps towards it you can possibly influence it that's another circle but you possibly can't control it because there's so many unknowns and it can be really helpful to do this and to make sure that you only focus on that your inner circle your circle of control because if you find you're expending loads of energy focusing on stuff outside it, it's pointless because you cannot control it 
So I, I hope that's helpful. And it can be useful sometimes just to keep a gratitude journal almost of, you know, what you're doing, what you're enjoying. It's those three positive thoughts for the day. Um, and, and what, you know, enhances your self-care. So I know that was kind of a whistle-stop tour, but I hope some of that was helpful just in terms of looking at, you know, mental health. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. And just going to Tyrone and Paige, um, just to reflect any, any, any thoughts and comments about, about what Sarah's just talked about. Tyrone. Yes, yeah, so that, that point about the thoughts and controlling the thoughts and actions. Uh, there was a thing that happened to me very early on was, and there was talk about masks and I thought, well, I don't know if I can afford to go out and be buying masks. So I kind of looked online and I got some fabric and I borrowed my mom's sewing machine and I made some masks, uh, made a collection of them and then gave them to my mom and friends and you know, mum and family members, my dad. Um, but then uh, last week, my niece spoke, got in touch with me and said, you know those masks you make, are you making any of them to sell? And I suddenly thought, oh, wow, actually, no. I, I, but I, I do now want to make them all for my family because now we're moving into that period where, where the, and so it's sort of, you know, that was a thought I had then about something I thought I could control. And it's kind of re, it's re-emerged as something that in a way has given me a sense of direction that actually if I spend a few days making more and more, I've got about 29 nieces and nephews, and then I'll just make them, put them in an envelope and send them off. And even if they never use them, it's like they'll have something that kind of, you know, I was able to make for them and, you know, Get, get a connection with them that way. Oh, that's lovely. Paige. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, um, for sharing that, because I think it's it's really helpful, it's really useful. And I think, you know, um, not to make an assumption about anybody who's here today um, taking part in the webinar, but, you know, we're all on our own journey. And some people maybe, you know, like, for example, for me, you know, therapy, it's like just going to the doctors, you know, I love it. It's part of my life journey. For some people, that's too much and you might not be ready. You might never be ready. So I think just understanding that mental health and talking about mental health can be accessible. It doesn't have to be this big, scary thing, you know, um, telling the whole world about what's going on in your life and, you know, going to see a therapist, which you might not be able to afford and, and all of that. So I think as Sarah's rightfully um, pointed out, there are so many things that you can you know, exercises you can do with yourself, um, finding people that you trust, you know, um, for me, that's, you know, particularly my mum and my auntie. Um, I can't talk to my dad about certain things, but that's okay because I can talk to her about other stuff. Um, and you may have friends in your circles who, you know, go through similar things or you, um, you know, you can confide in them. I think for me, personal tips that I've kind of, um, picked up over the years and I find it's really really helpful both both in my personal and my professional um, especially you know professional being a freelance that that it takes up a big uh, chunk of your life sometimes um, so one of them is sleep I know people bang on about it all the time water what you put in your body is essentially what you're going to get out and you know I never really used to drink massive amounts of like liquid liquids throughout the day and then the therapist was talking about it and I was like oh yeah 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 whatever whatever and I started doing it and I was like oh crikey I'm actually more alert I'm more aware um and yeah I think for me as a creative sometimes I find it really hard to go to sleep because for some reason at 11 o'clock at night my brain's like right let's create an event and I'm like no babe it's time to go to sleep so you know sometimes I keep a little notebook by my bed you know there's loads of different things that you can do to help yourself just like calm down you know listen to a piece of music that you find really calming think of a thought you know a memory with your nan or your mum or your best friend that's just really relaxing that makes you feel really calm and safe and comfortable um having a hobby and an interest and I think sometimes a lot of like the work that I do so freelancing in the creative sector being a creative, it is part of my hobbies, it's part of my interests, but sometimes it's really overwhelming, like going to meetings all the time or going to watch theatre performances at the theatre as much as I love it, because I know that I have, I'm kind of switched on in a professional sense as well. So 
I'm an avid gardener. I'll go out in the garden, even if it's tipping it down with rain. You know, that's my safe space. That's my happy place. And for some people, that's not your, that's not your self-care. But for me, that is, uh, you know, I've tried and tested it and it seems to be the thing that makes me feel good and it makes me feel happy. Um, switch off. Like if you ha I, I've had to actually start booking time in my diary where it's like page time, not page at work or page chilling out with my friends and family. It's literally just page, me, myself and I sat, dip, sat down, maybe I'm binge watching RuPaul's Drag Race or whatever it is, but it's just, it's my time. Um, and I think sometimes when I don't put it in the diary, as ludicrous as that might sound, I, I, I'll i just fool myself. I'll just tell myself yeah. not to do it. Whereas if I put it in my diary, I'm like, no, that, that's what I'm going to do. Um, just quickly, um, not being afraid to say no. Again, it's coming back to like that capacity thing. I think as a freelancer, you know, it works at your advantage and sometimes your disadvantage because sometimes you get to a point you're like, yeah, I need to take on all of this work, you know, and you kind of, you know, if you're employed, you get 28 days off, but when you're freelancing, you get to the end of the year and you're like, oh, I've actually only taken off two full days. Like that's a madness. So um, for me, I'm, I'm constantly, every single day, every single week, I'm like, am I at my full capacity? Yeah, I am. Somebody says, can you do this project? And I'm so gassed because I'm like, oh my God, it sounds amazing. But I have to remember, no, I, I need to have some time to myself. And it's going back to what I said earlier. Maybe you know somebody else in your circle who you trust, um, who does this, the same thing as you, whether that's a producer or a therapist or, you know, a, an actor. Um, and you say, well, let me link you up with this person. I trust them. Maybe they can help you. Um, keep your ego in check. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not going to go into it too much, but just keep your e ego in check just be yourself be yourself and be yourself um and yeah that that's that's it from me really on that one um as i said mental health is very different for everyone your techniques your self care is going to look very different but yeah definitely take the time to find out what works for you because you know i think sometimes people are like oh you know use this oil and this incense and that's great it works for some people it doesn't for for some others so just find out what works for you um, take the time to do that um, trust yourself trust yourself um, and that's the end of my sermon <laughs> <laughs> brilliant Paige thank you so um, and I just wholeheartedly resonate with what what you've just said it's it I think particularly in creative industries we are so we are delivering work that is our passion so that switching off piece finding time for you is incredibly important and I'm as equally guilty as everybody else in that, you know, I'm so committed and into my work that I, I, I struggle to switch off and I know that I'm really guilty of that. So finding those times to do that is really important. Now we've had a couple of questions in, um, Sarah, I'm, are you happy to share your slides? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I can send them around after. So that's not a problem at all. Perfect. And then a question from Tonya, how do you feel, how do you make that care and wellbeing part of work culture? rather than individual i work as a freelancer and teams and want to promote that in in the rooms i work in with other people so yeah um, i think uh, i think i mean i did a, a, a talk last week to film and tv uh, sort of heads of department and it is very much about embedding it in the culture so it is about a promotion support and it, but it's about embedding it so you have to have it within the culture so it's about having an open dialogue having letting people know where they need to go for support if they need support you know making sure that you kind of have a plan in place because you know if you reckon the recognize the signs someone's in, struggling you want to ask the most important thing is to recognize and ask and then you're going to listen and explore and then you're going to support and safeguard and you're not going to do step, step three support and safeguard if you have no idea what that looks like so it is about having a plan and you know especially in the creative industries it's it's very much about starting from the beginning and making sure everybody is on the same page you have an open dialogue you end the stigma and you talk about it and you have a plan in place so if people are struggling you know what you're going to offer as a terms of support you're not kind of floundering with oh well i'll get back to you i think that's what's important talking hey yeah and i think just to echo you know what sarah said as well you know i with the collect with the organizations that i work with now because you know i work 
freelance independently, but I also work freelance. I'm contracted by organisations to work with them. And I'm just very confident about it. You know, as soon as I come, as soon as I meet someone or I start a new working relationship, as I said, I just put my cards on the table. This is who I am. Um, I want you to feel like you can come and talk to me privately or in a group setting if there's a, a conflict or there's some issues, personal issues, whatever. And likewise, the same for me. Um, I've, you know, suggested to some of my, um, I call them my bosses, they're not my bosses, but, you know, some of my colleagues that I work with, you know, when we're having meetings, can we have a check-in session at the beginning? Nobody's obliged to, to do that check-in, but it's there in place. So for example, let's say, just a quick example, you know, you, you had a rough night last night, you know, you just, you, you're not feeling great um, and you just, you, you're feeling a bit moody. So that check-in session, I can say, yeah, had a bit of a rough night, not in the best of moods. So, you know, if I do snap or I say something out of turn, please don't take it personally. And really, it, it's, it's great because then you, whoever else is sitting in the room, they're just like, oh, okay, cool. And if something does happen, they can just send a text or take the person to the side and say, do you just need some time out? And then they might be like, oh yeah, that would be great, thanks. And then you can just get on with your work. So it's, it's really, again, it's just being honest and open and being candid and not being afraid. You know, we are human beings. And this idea that, you know, professional um, means that we, uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, Is it professional but, equals perfect as a free yeah, answer? Yeah, I think that's the thing. And, and, I, and I'm very, I'm not about that life really. Um, and yeah, so, and, and if I come, you know, if I come up with a client and they're like, yeah, I don't really think that check-in's going to work then I see how it goes working with them. And then maybe at the end of that, I think to myself, I do a, a, an audit and I think maybe it's not best to work with that client again. We're not, we're not on the same wavelength. So it's safeguarding yourself and safeguarding others, but safeguarding yourself first and foremost um, and everything will follow. You know, you will start to build that resilience. You will start to, to know how you work best and who you work best with. Um, and just leading by example, if people are seeing that you're allowing space for, I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, you, for example, somebody, you, you're not obliged to join in with the check. And if someone says, no, it's, I'm not comfortable, that's not how I want to work, that's fine. Um, but it's just putting it out there for people who might not have had the confidence to say, oh, I think that's a good idea. Um, so, yeah, just embedding, like Sarah says, well-being practice and what you're doing. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paige. Don't turn your mic off yet because you are now going, we're going to have a moment of well-being and check-in before we move on to the next stage, aren't we? So Aha, uh -huh. is as the time come. The time has come. So um sorry, I'm gonna take my phones off, put my iPad on charge. So um yeah, it's obviously is it two hour this is a two hour webinar, um, and I'm sure everybody's probably used to this kind of like back to back Zoom um culture at the moment um and yeah sometimes you might just feel a bit like oh i don't know what the last person's just said i'm running out of capacity i need a bit of a break so is it five, five minutes alison can we just take three just because three we just yeah three yeah. minutes quick leg stretch so yeah we're gonna take a, a three minute break um and i would just encourage people you know turn your camera off do a bit of a stretch, shake your body, you know, go around the room, see what you've got in the room, actually connect with the environment that you're in, just refresh your brain, go and have something to drink, go and have something to eat, come back refreshed. Um, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. Um, if not, that's fine and, and we'll just resume. Um, but yeah, do what you need to do for three minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Paige. Thanks.
that's better. Nice. <laughs> yes, indeed. Brilliant. I think people are just coming back. Signers, are you ready to go? Yep, brilliant. Okay, let's let's crack on because I am conscious that we're just uh, we've got a lot to talk about in the second half. So we've talked about skills, we've talked about mental health. We're now going to talk a little bit about value. And whilst it's important to know what you need to live on, as this in, does inform what you need to charge, it doesn't tell you your value. And I really wanted to spend more time focusing on value because working out what you need to live on is a question of looking at your outgoings, looking at your expenses and, and really adding that up. And I think that's something that people are very good at doing in their own time. So your value is the value that you bring to a client or a company by doing that voodoo that you do so well. It's your, it's your secret source. It could be fulfilling a client need. It could be enhancing their creative vision, increasing the sales in their business or making say, helping them make savings on the bottom line, whatever it is that you do, um that's that's where you add your your value and we're going to look at how you can start to think about that and to calculate it now obviously the baseline is how much do i need to live on and particularly how many paid days can i expect in a year because as a freelancer we're not employees we're not going to get paid the same amount every month so realistically how many paid days um am I going to be able to expect in a year? Because it's not going to be 365 and it's probably not going to be, you know, it's not going to be 52 weeks. It's not going to be, it's probably not even going to be as many as 48 weeks times five days. So 240 days. So, you know, because not only are you going to have to deliver your work, you've got to do all the working on your freelancing, all those development meetings, all of those client conversations to try and win the business. So I try and work out a rate based on working about 120 paid days in the year, which allows me time to work on my freelancing, but also time to work in it. And it gives me space to kind of think, well, actually, if my outgoings are much, much higher or suddenly increase, I've got scope to find more capacity to add more paid days into the year to look at that. So, um, but I also know, so, so like that gives me a sense of what my kind of average day rate might be. If I know what I'm spending each year and then I can divide that by 120. I've got to make sure as a freelancer that I include not just, I've, I've got my outgoings, but then I need to make sure I add back in any tax and national insurance that's due. So it's the total that I turn over um, rather than just my taxable income. But um, I know that my rate is going to vary as well because I work, I work in different sectors, I work for different companies, I work doing different projects and all of them have different rates. So I can come up with an average daily rate but at the same time I also need to look in more detail to say well actually what's what's the rate that will work for this particular sector and that's where I can do quite a lot of benchmarking and I can um, look for published resources so um, you know who's publishing resources that say what sort of rates might be appropriate so back to the union they have published rate guidelines on their website they, they cover film and tv they cover entertainment they cover a whole broad section of stuff um there are lots of guilds and organizations that come together that um help to show what and what a rate might be um so you want to look at that but you also might want to look at paid job advertisements so if there's a job that's a permanent position but it's similar to the work that you do what's the rate they're asking what's the rate they're offering for that but remember as a freelancer um you can ask for more than that because 
when a company publishes a salary rate, they're publishing that, but they've also got to pay nearly 14% employers national insurance. Plus they've got to give you a desk, a computer, a phone, whatever else. So you can probably add on 25% minimum to the cost of the, the, the advertised salary in terms of what it costs the company. So don't forget to factor that in when you're looking at rates. You can also look at freelance opportunities. So you're benchmarking across all of those all of those things that you can find online but also you can ask people talk to people um tread carefully because not everyone wants to actually tell you what rate they will pay and what they're charging and that kind of stuff but that's where mentors can be really valuable to you somebody who's a couple of steps ahead of you following a career trajectory that you want to take talk to them they'll probably be more open if you build a relationship with them to help you understand what your value might be at this stage and how you can how you can think about this. Equally, when I'm thinking about my rates, so I've got how much I need to live on, how many days I'm gonna work in a year, I can benchmark, but then I need to also think about, well, what? who's the audience? Who's the intended audience for, for my projects? So if I'm working on something that's speculative, it's a pitch, I'm working with a client and they're trying to use what I'm doing to create a vision to then sell it on to another client, but they're investing in my time. They might not be able to pay me as much as when they get that funding for that project or whatever, or they win the client commission, whatever that might be. So I might agree to work on a lower rate for that, knowing that I'll get the full rate and I'm commi they're committed to me for that project. So those intended audiences can be really important because we want to understand the context of the work that we've been offered and look at whether that's the right opportunity. Always be aware of the client that only gets you in for the pictures and never takes you on for the full commission and or never actually gets the full commission because you know that's not quite adding up but also looking at not only those intended audiences but also well what are you being hired to do um what's the sector that you're working in so when i work in film and tv as a producer or a line producer i'm delivering those services but i'm equally i'm hired in um universities to talk to media students to talk about being a producer and a line producer so those are very different rates as well so think about how you're using your skills as well as those sectors so those are different strategies for thinking about how and where you are adding value and how to look at the marketplace and build up what you are looking to do is build up a whole a whole set of information which can help you identify what you can charge for whatever for what the, the opportunity that comes along and you're feeling informed about it and also to build up a sense of well how many days a week do i need to work at this rate how many at this rate how many at this rate or or weeks or how many projects do i need to get in or whatever size or scope to help me make sure i can make ends meet because that then starts to tell you if you've got to work 48 50 weeks of the year to deliver this then you've got to think well actually is my rate too low um what what where's there's an imbalance there so thinking about that and when i'm pricing myself to a client um I'm always careful to, because I think freelancers, you know, we've talked about earlier, we're specialist skills. We've got high value skills that people want from us. So I see myself and all freelancers as a, as a luxury. We're a designer item. We're valued. We want to be valued. So when I price myself for a client, I want them to value me. So when I give them a price, I'm listening out for the sharp intake of breath. I call it the sharp intake of breath test. I want to listen out and hear the... Oh, that sharp intake of breath that tells me when I pitch my price to them that it's high, but I've given them a really, really compelling reason why they should have me on their team doing what I'm going to do because I'm going to deliver for them that creative vision, increased sales, whatever it might be, that special source they've really bought into. But pitching it at the sharp intake of breath level means that there's room for us to have a little bit of a negotiation but actually they're going to value me and what I do. And if I don't hear that, I always come away feeling like I've left something on the table. I could have got a slightly better rate for that project. So I'm always listening out for that. And I love to hear it when, I, when I'm talking to clients. So, um, but I think in, in this economic climate, whilst that's absolutely a strategy and looking at how we can 
explain to clients, and we'll talk about it a bit more in a minute when we talk about the networking side of stuff, but how we can explain what the value that we add. So we take the conversation away from being about price because we are delivering specialist services. So, um, and one of the things that, that's challenging, particularly at the moment, and I've seen lots of conversations in film and TV forums about this, is about my rate, my current rate, and how the economics of supply and demand are really challenging rates at the moment. Because when you've got a sector that's in hibernation, and there's very little work going on, you've got a huge supply of freelancers and people that can potentially do those jobs. So what does that mean? That means that there's way more supply than there is demand. And that just naturally drives down the prices. So as sectors open up and as opportunities go up, that balance changes and you can start to look at actually prices will go up again. So um, it's really hard because at the moment, I think there is a pressure on downward pricing, but actually that's where we have to rein ourselves in and, and really focus on the clients that will really value us, really drive, really focus on how we can supply the value that they need in a way that doesn't become about price and we build that connection with them. Um, so I guess what um, a panel I'd like to go over to you and just start to think about well how do you work out your value? Why do clients come to you? How do you work out that value? Um, Paige I can see you nodding here so are you there? Hello. Um, yeah, I think you've, I mean, you've really kind of <clears throat> spoken about it in its breadth, Alison, because it, it really is a juggling act. And I think it's really interesting because when you're employed, somebody automatically puts a value on not only your technical skills, but also the other skills that we've already talked about to the table. Um, so I think we are very used to in that situation where we're employed to be very kind of like uh, submissive and just just go with it and we internalize that value that other people put on us whereas as freelancers it really does make you kind of like hold the mirror up and you really have to question yourself and it's a it's a thing of um, humility but confidence as well in finding that balance because you know you want to be really realistic and honest about what are the skills that you're bringing to the table um, and you know not kind of really pricing yourself above what you think you're actually capable of because actually that works to your detriment if let's say you're overpriced you're overpricing yourself um, that's a lot to live up to if you don't have that skill so it goes goes back to skills audit you know every single piece of work that you're um, you're you're looking to um to go for or that you're you're already doing you constantly auditing the skills that you have and and how that matches with what needs to be delivered um i think as well uh what you spoke about as well alison about kind of sense checking um sense checking with mentors so you know for me i i am a mentor but i'm also mentored um, and it, I always see the value in having you know mentors and mentors across different for me across different sectors and at different levels um, that's really helpful to sense check um, and again you know place like ITC back to using those as kind of guidelines um, I mean what your basic pay should be um, because as you said, you're not, it's not realistic to think that you're going to be working in the same capacity as somebody who's employed, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, nine, nine to five. Um, but yeah, so it's, again, it's that intersection, that range of skills that you have, the soft skills, the technical skills. Um, just to put an, to give you an example. So for example, I recently have just started to do more work with some of the clients that I'm working with in terms of like uh, business strategy um, and kind of um, legalizing like company formation work essentially. So that's still pretty new to me. I've, I've learned quite a bit over the, the past few months, but you know, I wouldn't say I'm an absolute expert in it. But for example, if somebody comes to me and says, can you do some diversity consultancy? you you better you better know that I'm going to be pricing up high because you know at the end of the day I'm a black woman I'm I'm queer I'm gay so uh, my personal experience my personal lived experience you know of of um, 
uh, as a person of color, as a, as a black woman, as a, as a gay, as a gay person, as a gay woman, as a gay black woman, the a whole intersection of that, that's a lot of value. That's 28, live, 28 years of lived experience that I have. Not to mention, you know, when I've been working with other people in my past, let's say, you know, I meet somebody else, um, with uh, some kind of neurodiversity or somebody who's coming from a particular background or a particular experience, I constantly carry that with me and make sure, you know, like if I'm in a panel position, making sure that I'm thinking about all those different people that I've met with different life experiences and how I can platform those people. So coming back, because I'm kind of segueing, but coming back to you know if somebody asked me to do some diversity consultancy i'm going to charge them a lot more than i am going to um you know put my fee up for um business formation because it's lived experience that i have and i have to acknowledge that is that is high, that is of high value um so i think again it comes to mental health and it comes down to the relationship that you have with yourself like how do you value yourself um you know Oh, thanks, Paige. Yeah. Tyrone. Tyrone. Yeah. yeah, can I come in? Yeah, it's, uh, well, there's kind of two elements to my, my answer to this, because in, um, I, I, I consider myself an artist, and, but there's two aspects to being an artist for me. There's the, the function of an artist, which is to sort of discover truth and tell it to the world. And then there's the job of an artist, which is essentially when I'm an actor, there are rates, there are um, um, yeah, guidelines through equity or through the writers union in terms of uh, my writing. And so I kind of, I will work with those. And then there are escalations built into them that are built on my, my relative experience. But then when it comes to my function as an artist, if there's someone who's after me because I have these range of skills, what I've done over the years is I've, I've kind of, looked at the what they're asking from me and I will assess whether the value of it to me is high or low um, artistically and if it has a high value to to me then I will negotiate on the on the fee but essentially be looking to get involved with the piece on a level where I feel I have some authority over it. If it feels like something they're asking me on for, I don't know, my, uh, my value as a person or with my experience, but the money isn't right, then I'll, I'll tend to walk away from that. So I kind of have, yes, I have a, a sense that my value as a actor, where it, the pay structure is quite clear, is one thing, but my value as an artist that's the one that where I use to decide whether I will take a job for the money that's being offered or I will try to negotiate up the fee. Brilliant. Thanks, Tyrone. Sarah, what, what, what's uh, your reflections? I thought just, yeah, I mean, just quickly, obviously I work as an employee, so I work for the Production Guild as their training manager. And what I realised the other day is I'm much better at negotiating a rate for them um, than I am for myself and I think that's because they're such a big established brand and also because it's not me personally I you know I'm very firm this is the rate this is what we charge but obviously I know my audience I wouldn't charge Netflix for a course the same as I would charge a producer for a one-to-one -one. but what I've realized is I don't look at myself as a brand which I think is the mistake so I don't put that value on as much what I do and the skills I bring as I'm not this big brand but actually I think that's quite important if we value ourselves and almost you know there's a price for us as a brand I think that would be a better way to look at it so I'm not necessarily selling myself but I'm selling my business and my skills and I think I've personally accumulated a sense of myself as a brand which is what helps me yeah. at the moment but early on I did not been in that state at all yeah that's where I'm gonna catch you up there I've got to get there Tyrone <laughs> Brilliant. We've had a couple of questions around, firstly, about should we be raising or lowering our rates in response to the pandemic? Um, I'm, I'm always in favour of raising rates where you can. I think it's about changing the conversation, about really focusing on where you add value. And there will be clients that will only be looking to lower rates. But actually, I'm looking for people that want to build a sustainable long term relationship with me as a freelancer and value me. So 
So I can see my panel nodding on, mm -hmm. on that. So I'm going to throw the next question open and say, if you've worked with a client for a lower rate um, and you've really wanted to work with them or on a particular project, how do you broach the subject of increasing fees for future projects? Because I know that's something that freelancers struggle with is you've done something with somebody for one rate. How do you get the rate up? How do you get it to where you feel it should be? From my point of view, that would depend on whether I've established enough of a relationship with them for, to be able to argue my value to them or to present my value to them. If I can, if I have that relationship, then it's, I, I think I'd find it easier. If it's a relationship where, where in a way, the imbalance of power is, uh, they have all the power, then I think it's, uh, it feels like a much more difficult task. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess I was thinking, you know, I think if I'm certain that if I've negotiated a rate, especially like as an introduction or when it's something new and I wanted to build that relationship, so I've negotiated possibly a lower rate, I think I feel much more comfortable coming back if I know I've done a really good job and that they're really pleased with what I've done to come back and say, look, you know, I'm really pleased, you're pleased, but this is my, you know, going forward, can we look at this rate? And being prepared to negotiate a bit, but not just settling. And I think it's like Tyrone said, it's about when you're secure in that relationship and you know you've done a good job and that you've really shown your value, then you're in a much better position to say, you know, let, let's look to move up the pace. And also maybe at the beginning when you build that, say this is an introductory rate. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that, that helps you enormously if you've said it's an introductory rate at the beginning. Um, so they know that that's the case and you're trying things out. Paige, do you have anything specific to add? Um, yeah, just quickly, I think, like you said, everyone said already, it's about the language and I think getting in the habit of practicing how you're pitching and how you're talking about your rates. So, for example, Alison, you just talked about, you know, this being very candid, this is an introductory rate or, you know, saying, OK, for this particular project, um, I can do such and such at this rate. So already the clients getting in their head, OK, for this particular project. So if we do another project, it's kind of you going back to the drawing board really and it is it is about the skills what skills you can be bringing in bring into the table um so yeah but that's more about in in the beginning or your, your next client relationship being prepared to to be very specific about the language that you're using yeah and and equally just before we move on i think if you are working for a client and you do want to put your rates up you can ask them and there's only kind of three options that come out they they say yes and you're really happy and you carry on working together at the higher rate um and they say no which means at that point you've got a choice do you walk away because actually you don't want to continue keep working at that rate or do you agree that you'll continue at that rate and you know, how are you going to feel about that? Are you going to build resentment? That kind of thing. So you, you've got to really think about how you broach it and what, importantly, if you are going to broach it, what your reaction is going to be and what, what outcome will be good for you from the conversation. So trying to, I'm always trying to think about where my client, where my customer's coming from, try and put them myself in their shoes. And that will help me drive, well, what's the reason they might say no? What's the reason they might say yes? Where's the opportunity coming up whereby there's a project that I could work on that's got a better budget and they can put the rate up? Those kind of questions. And that amazingly beautifully segues into our final section of, of this session, which is all about how we're going to build our networks and how we can develop or develop that and and first of all we've talked a lot about what we do to solve our customers problems but really what I like to encourage is when you've done your your skills audit and you've got this list of all the things that you can do what you can do is trying to turn all of those into um, statements that answer the question why me why is a client going to come to me why are they going to come why are they going to value me so all of the skills all of the things that you can offer why are people coming to me so just like Apple say and their advertising about why you need an iPod because you can have a thousand songs in your pocket it connects with the heart. You, you're looking as a freelancer to connect with your client's heart. So we take the conversation away from those 
factual price-based things, but it comes about why me, why they can't live without you. Um, and it's very much like, for me, freelancing is very much like dating. Um, the ultimate goal I'm looking for as a freelancer is to build a long-term relationship with my clients. So yeah, I'm going to have to kiss a few frogs along the way. Not every client that I work with is going to be the best client ever. Some of them just won't share my values. Um, they won't, you know, it's like Tinder. They won't be a match. But when you do find someone who does share your values, then you're looking at that courtship, that building that relationship, going on a little date, going on the next date. And it's all about building up that trust and that rapport with your clients so that actually you know you understand where each other are coming from it built in a lot of the challenges we talked around with mental health and checking in because you're getting to know people but equally um you're 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 building that relationship for the future and so much of that is around it, it you can't underestimate how important just being a nice person to have around is as a freelancer and part of a team because there's always people who can do a similar job to us but are we the right person to do it? And do we complement and sit well in that team? Um, so thinking about, if you can explain why pe why your clients should hire you, why you add value and all of that, then you think, okay, so how do I build? How do I build on my networks? What do I do? So the anthropologist Robin Dunbar coined, his, coined the term Dunbar's number, which put simply is, is really the number of people you can maintain in your network such that, if you bumped into them in a cafe or a bar, you'd know exactly who each other are and you could happily sit down for a conversation. So Dunbar proposes that this number is 150. So if I've got 150 people in my network and you've all got 150 in your networks, then that makes 150 times 150, 22,500 people who are at one step removed from each of us. So that's an awful lot of potential people in your network who we can all introduce each other to. So what this means is we've actually, there's way more people that we can get in touch with than we think. So if I pull together a list of the 150 people in my network, I can then look at them and think, well, who, how, how, how can, how, what sort of conversation can I have with them? Why, why, what's the why me conversation that I will have with them? So um, those people could be potential clients. They could be sponsors. Now, sponsors are some of my favorite type of people because those are people who are talking about me when I'm not in the room and selling my services. So, like, I love my sponsors. Um, my mentors, we've talked about mentors already, people who you can look to for advice. And introducers. Now, introducers are really important to us as freelancers because these are people we know well. They're not ever going to be potential clients, but they've got networks and they can possibly introduce you to people. So if you're looking to develop your freelancing activities, particularly at this time, coming out of lockdown, if there's, if there's not much work in your traditional area, think about who these introducers could be, those people in your networks who work in other sectors, in other places. Um, who can they introduce you to? What how how go and have some conversations with them that can open your open you up to new ideas new opportunities and new networks so even if you don't know what the opportunity is go and talk to them look at what are those relative skills what are your transferable skills how might they see them valuable in their sector and how you might be able to transfer in to find new freelancing opportunities so once you've got a list of people in your network your 150 and worked out who's going to play what role for you you can get in touch and give them your why me pitch um, and it'll be different as i said for those different types of people um, and the simplest thing to do is get in touch with, to get in touch with people is drop them a quick email. And my mentor, Mike Southern, he, he wrote a book called The uh, Beer Mass Entrepreneur, and he describes it as writing a magic email. It's 15 seconds to win 15 minutes. And what he means by that is the email should take no longer than 15 seconds to read, which means it's really short. Oh, because one of my pet hates, it really is a major pet hate, is really long emails. And I've really stopped writing them and I hate receiving them. So 15 seconds and you're asking for 15 minutes of someone's time. And you're just gonna say a quick hello 
outline your why me, the problem that you think you can solve for that client, that customer, why you're best at solving it, obviously. And then what's your proof? What's your corroboration? So if you're doing, if someone's introducing you, that's the corroboration that introduces provided that this person's great. They're introducing me. I'm happy to introduce. If I introduce um, Sarah to Paige, for example, then Paige is going to know that Sarah's a good egg because I've introduced her because we know each other, vice versa. So those introducers are really important. And then you're just asking for 15 minutes, a quick conversation. And this is a really straightforward way to grow your network. And not only that, if you start reaching out to people in your networks who are in different sectors, you can start to find opportunities that you didn't know existed. And that's very much what this, what I'm, I hope you'll take away from this session is the is how to go out and look and find opportunities to use the skills that you've been using in the creative industries in new and exciting ways to add value, to deliver your secret sauce, but in new and exciting ways. And I think for me as well, it's really important not to be afraid to ask people for advice. Um, and one thing is always listen. Listen to what people are saying and listen hard. Listen for the challenges, listen for the problems, look for the opportunities. How can you be best placed to take the pain away from somebody? How can you provide a solution? So it's all about thinking about where the client's pain is, why they need some help, how you can solve their problem. So really focusing on where you add value and really listening to your clients. So that was my monologue and soliloquy about leveraging your network. So I'd like to open it up to the panel. Sarah, how, how do you leverage your networks? What do you do? You're on mute. Sarah, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, I've turned it off. I didn't mute myself. I was muted. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking a lot about networks. I think it is about, it's those connections and it's the people you've met. And um, what when we were talking about this the other day, and I realized I'm really good at networking individually about doing that, reaching out and saying, can we have a quick chat? Um, you know, short emails, you know, how you getting on. I'm not so good at the big room stuff. You know, we have lots of events through work, you know, um, where you know the idea is you're meant to network I find that much harder so I think it is about working out how you network how you're the best at presenting yourself and building those connections you know are you one of those people that can walk into a massive room and just you know spread yourself thin around the room and that doesn't work for me personally so I think it is about identifying your skills as a networker and accepting that you know you don't have to be one of those networkers that can work a room you can be a different you can do it differently in a way that works for you and I think it is like Alison said about those short emails and those connections and building connections. You know, once you've got that good rapport with someone looking at actually what could we do together? How could we somehow combine our skills to work together? And I think that's that's really important using the creativity. Brilliant. Um, Tyrone, what about you? How do you leverage your networks? Well, it depends which sector I'm working in. In theatre, I kind of look at theatre and uh, as a, a social profession i.e. that actually you end up you don't end up in a rehearsal room with someone who hates you basically is one of the things so you kind of uh, in, in terms of the theatre network I feel like what I can do is meet people and I can bring my knowledge of theatre as a form and it you know a piece of work and that opens doors for me in terms of uh, um, you know, people who may employ me because they feel that I've got, you know, they start to get a glimpse of the skills I can bring. In film and TV, when I do that kind of work, I have no leverage. I kind of, I'm in the hands of my agent on that respect. But one the sort of thing that can happen is that I might build a, a, a relationship with a director. And this happened to me, I was working on a project last year, I built a relationship with a director we had to do some pickups and the director wanted me, but I was aware the producer didn't because I, I was being regarded as an unnecessary expense. But the director championed for me to be brought back and the additional fee that that came with because I had a good relationship with the director and that came on the floor when we were working together. In terms of things like the boardroom and that sort of uh, sector, uh, often people aren't looking at me as an artist in that world at all and very rarely aware that I am but when it does happen that I open up that territory for them then suddenly I get a different 
they, they look at me uh, very differently and, and they might start to point me in the, in the direction of opportunities that they're aware of through their organization. So it's a different strategy for each, but often it's about that ultimately it's about some sort of form of per personal relationship and as I say that's how I prefer to function like Sarah was talking about I'm not the type of person who walks into the room and takes it over because I don't have that personality I was working with someone like that earlier this week who does have that personality and I envied it but I'm glad I'm not it. Paige what about you how do you leverage your networks? Um, yeah I think kind of I'm a bit of an ambivert, so I can go from, you know, what Tyrone has described as the hermit to like literally loving, living life, being super social. But even that being said, again, I'm one of those people, I prefer not to kind of go to the swanky events. And again, just to reiterate, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's how you vibe, if that's how you flow, if that's what works for you, do it. Um, but yeah, find out what works for you. Um, for me, it's, I've learned that, it, again, it's kind of, you know, you say it's a bit like dating or, you know, how you would kind of build a relationship with a, with a new friend or, or something like that. For me, it's about investing in relationships. I'm looking at, like you said, that sustainability, that long term, you know, if, if our values and the ethos align, you know, then hopefully that relationship's going to uh, last for um, quite a while. And then going back to some things that I said earlier about, you know, for example, in a situation where you might be at full capacity and you you know introduce that client to um somebody else a freelancer that you trust and that you know um you're hoping that that freelancer that you've passed on work to might return you the favor you know in the future in a future situation so i think for me it's investing in relationships being genuine being authentic being yourself um and finding people that you do work with really, really well. Um, and then also not being afraid to not work in silos. I think sometimes as freelancers, we get in our heads about, oh my God, like we can't work together with competition. And, you know, for me personally, that's a crock of, I won't say the word, but I, I don't think that's relevant really. I think the more we can come together, the stronger, the better we are. We don't always have to work on the same project with each other or the same event or whatever it is, work with the same client. Um, but sometimes you can and, and really like, once you've built up a network of freelancers um, around you that you trust and, and you help each other out, utilizing that, you know, it doesn't have to be shady or deceitful or any of this stuff, which, you know, I kind of, I, I trained as a dancer um back in the day and you know that's kind of how networking was pitched to me it's like oh you know i'm not going to go into some of the scenarios but i was <laughs> like that's that's not how i vibe babe but like, i'm not on that one for me it's about building genuine relationships um and moving around with people who see the world as i do or not necessarily see the world as i do but want kind of want the, a similar future better world um yeah kind of thing so brilliant that, that's that's how i network really or leverage networks thanks so much everyone so um that kind of wraps up our kind of panel discussion and everything i'm going to open it up to questions in a minute but i'd love to invite rinky to just uh jump in now and talk to us about your role rinky as the west midlands representative for the freelance task force and any reflections you want to make on the conversations that you've heard so rinky the flu floor is yours you're on oh sorry you're on, not on mute okay fine so um yeah i've been um part of the task force in the west midlands um and with the birmingham rep theater and yeah so so far um i've been more in a, a a listening role just trying to get on board the concerns um of people i i know that one of the popular topics and people have concerns about is income of course over the whole pandemic that's been a massive roadblock for many people 
um, and a lot of people have shared their stories which which I've taken on board um, so it's trying to get people to talk to me and raise anything that they have in terms of concerns worries and sometimes it's very hard for them to broach those subjects so next week we're setting up um, a bit more of a sort of feeler session um, I don't know if there is anybody who's keen to take part in that discussion but again um, sometimes people are sort of zoomed out a little bit aren't we um, <laughs> we're so used to being on zoom now that not only do our brains switch off but so do our eyes so it's just trying to break that cycle break that culture and hopefully have those conversa conversations um, based on the Westminster Woodlands based on what's happening now and also looking forward to the future landscape um, but yeah, income, I think, is definitely one of the big topics. Um, and that can be everything from managing your money, finances throughout the year, or indeed whatever savings you have to um, pool your resource. Um, also, the Black Lives Matter um, movement has been a big topic as well. People on a daily basis are facing barriers and so there have been some shared experiences linked to that. Um, I'm not black, I'm Asian, but of course, um, yeah, as part of the British um, conversation, people are talking generally about the barriers and there's lots of questions and talk and discussions around that as well with deaf people who have been through rather difficult times, um, they're sharing their stories as well. I think generally speaking, yeah, it would be those things that I've mentioned, um, income and the Black Lives Matter movement, and also looking at what we can do in terms of practical solutions. And there are people out there who do really care, who are in very supportive, proactive discussion roles, who want to raise these topics with a view to solving things. So it's just remembering that, you know what, we are not alone. Yes, we work in a freelance capacity, but I want to remind everybody here that we're not alone. We are going through a pandemic collectively, actually um and so we need to support each other throughout that um so yeah i think as sarah was talking about mental health as well looking after our well-being that is number one priority and trying to make sure that we incite other people to do that my, part of my focus is in the deaf community because it is a marginalized isolated community so mental health is a very big topic next week um we are going to be talking to people who are talking about sharing their wishes and hopes and dreams for the West Midlands. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm talking about people in the artistic sort of corpus, but yeah. Um, and if um, anybody on this call wants to raise anything with me, please do so. I'm more than happy to be a listening ear, um, whether it be in this meeting or another one. And we can, of course, talk on Zoom <laughs> um, if you want to do that. Brilliant. Thank you, Rinky. Thank you so much. So, um, are there any questions? I can see Joe's just put a question in here. Sparked by the performance oriented freelance task force record. Uh, represented by Rebecca Rosie also in this meeting and I'm part of a small group aiming to ensure there is advocacy for non-performance freelancers. We have a brief conversation book tomorrow with someone from the freelance task force so we'd love to be in touch with others so not to reinvent the wheel if non-performance freelancers are already being advocated for. So Rinko, are, are, you, are you representing non-performance freelancers as well? Um, so at the moment, I'm focusing on performance um, freelancers, artists, artists, however you want to categorise them, um, in a freelance capacity. So um, those are the relationships that we're looking to build at the moment. Right, thank you. So it sounds like um, the, the non-performance freelancers, I know certainly film and TV has come together very, very strongly on that side of things. So, you know, it's probably worth looking at um, what's going on there and I'm sure cult I'm looking at Kezia now to say I'm sure Culture Central is very interested in supporting the non-performance freelancers as well and that's part of what this session is about so so um if if anyone's got any specific um links that they want to share maybe Kezia would you put your email in the chat so if people have got some follow-ups they can follow up directly with Kezia who's um, on the cultural response unit. So if you want to let people know of 
task force conversations that you've got going on, things you want to publicize, then you can send that around in the follow up. Would that be okay? Um, are there any other questions about these themes? I feel like we've kind of gone through a kind of whole freelancer journey here and I've certainly taken away quite a lot. And I think at, at the heart for me, freelancers are, you know, we are, I think as Paige said really early on, creative problem solvers. And, um, you know, yes, there's really, really dreadful stuff going on around us, but on a, on a basic simple level as a freelancer to enable our own survival and our own, our own support it's about how do we creatively problem solve ourselves around this scenario if the road is blocked because we can't do what we usually do and what what i've tried to provide us um, with the panel here today is some insights and tools and ways of thinking that can help you address how to navigate round and sarah in some of our earlier conversations right at the start you talked about kind of sitting on the bench and waiting for things to move on and i think yeah. we're at that stage now where actually we've actually really got to get off the bench and find a way to yeah. to move through Yeah, definitely. I think yeah, it's time to move. Yeah, the stuff is starting to move. And I think it's also not to get taken away with the frustration that some people are going to move at a different pace. You know, yeah. stuff is going to pick up faster. Yeah. Everybody's going to walk, walk or run this next bit in their own way. And it's not beating yourself up yeah. if others are perceived much further ahead. Yeah, and I think I think particularly to the culture sector, I think it, I think it's 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 a really hard place to be at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think acknowledging that because you you can see a lot of stuff coming out of lockdown, a lot of sectors opening up, and feeling very behind the curve and wondering what that means for you. And that's very much about acknowledging that, taking some of that on board, but equally going, okay, so actually, how do I rethink my skills how do i rethink the opportunities how do i rethink the value because um we we're human I, you know the reason that our cultural sector in in the country and in the region is so strong is because actually you know the one thing we haven't said today is how valuable all of that creativity is to our mental health by experiencing culture by experiencing creativity that's really really important so actually people how do we find creative ways to respond to that how do we find creative ways to get our messages out there to do the work that we do and that's that's really what i've been trying to 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 help you find different ways to think about it um any 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 other questions from anyone or... i've just got one observation um that yeah. uh one of the ways that uh, has really helped me over this period is by is by kind of attending and joining those um, some of the cultural response unit uh, discussions because in that in the middle of that I've then found particular groups that I've been able to associate with outside of that network but it almost feels like by going into that network it's a good place to start to find the people that maybe have your specific connections as well. Brilliant. And any specific questions for anyone about the networking, about the value, about the skills? Paige, any reflections or observations that you've taken away from the session while I just look to see if there's any more questions? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I've put a bit of a, I've put a little, my email in the chat because I'm going to have to go shortly. But yeah, I think I'm happy, very happy for people to get in contact um, by email. If you have any like further questions or you just want to have a chat, um, I think these conversations are really important. It's great to see so many of you on the, the Zoom uh, chat today and, and thank you for, you know, um, being a part of it. I hope, you know, from the bits and bobs that I've said and collectively and um, with the rest of the panel and Alison, I hope that we've helped to affirm some things that you maybe already thought or felt um but also to kind of bring some new ideas or new thoughts um into the mix as well but yeah i'm just really appreciative thank you so much um alison um and culture center as well for this opportunity and yeah hopefully um bump into uh some of you if not all of you in the future um whether that's on zoom or in the in the real world <laughs> But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to drop out because I'm hosting a, another session now. But thank you so much, everyone, um, for your time today this afternoon. Brilliant. Thank you.
Brilliant, Paige. Thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. Um, uh, Sarah and Tyrone, should we just wrap up with some, some final, final comments um, just in the last couple of minutes? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think from my perspective, I think, I guess from listening to so many freelancers and counselling so many, I think, and then but following on from what you said, it really is about leveraging those connections and talking to people, whether it's about mental health or work and just having those open dialogues. I think it's so helpful to feel like you're moving. You know, if you feel like you're putting stuff into place, even if it might not happen till next year, it's that sense of movement, I think, that's really important at this time. Yeah, I'd agree very much with uh, Sarah on that one. That the and and from where I've been, uh, where I'm sitting, that some of that movement does come from the snatches of information and experiences that uh, you know you pick up from other people, and 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 yeah, being and and in a way connecting, because I think the biggest danger is sort of being isolated. Um, and be, especially you're, you're a freelancer, you're isolated in the first place, but at this time being isolated, I think for me is the biggest uh, danger and, uh, and to find ways of connecting up. And it's been great to connect up with people here today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. And yeah, that, that connection thing for me is really important. I always try to go in with such an open mind to just think, well, how can I find an opportunity in this conversation? How, what can I learn from it? What, what can I, what, what can I discover? Because um, then I can be open to finding those new steps. And, and sometimes I'll walk into a conversation with a client and I don't really know where I'm going in because I can't really see that obvious connection, but I'll go anyway, because it just sounds interesting and it feels like an interesting thing to do. And I'll come out and go, Oh wow. I never thought if I pointed in that direction, that could happen and I think that's that's some of the the things that actually we've got we've got within our networks the ability to do that and being open to that can help take us as Sarah says feel like we're moving forward but finding new opportunities so that we're not reliant just on one way and one sector to make our living so that when Rinku talks about income being really challenging and it absolutely is it's how can I how can I diversify that risk by finding new sectors and new opportunities and new clients because there are lots of really busy people at the moment there are some sectors that are really busy how 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 can we find ourselves doing work in that space even if it's just in the short term but actually we might quite enjoy it as well so um lots of different ways to think about what we can do and how we can add value to solve customers problems and enjoy being able to do what we're really good at so that's me wrapped up thank you everybody so much for taking the time to join us i hope you've enjoyed it i hope i've given you lots of food for thought um i will send around via kezia the um skills audit and sarah's slides and if there's any other links um you can send those around as well kezia so thank you so much everybody for taking the time to join us today and i look forward to seeing you all again soon on another zoom or in person and hopefully with maybe a, a little drink or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you alison thanks alison thanks and for thank you to me. my panel as well sorry alison. and my great moderators kezia and gurpreet so thank you everyone it's been a pleasure thanks